Welcome, YouTubers, to another episode in my Grammar Hero series. In today's video, I'm going to work out some practice problems from the arithmetic reasoning subtest from uh, the third practice test on my website. In case this is your first time finding my YouTube channel, I want to mention that I do have a small website that I recently created. And on that website, there are three practice tests that roughly and quickly estimate your AFQT score. Uh, for this practice test, the link's right here. Um, I encourage you to either use this video uh, to work on these practice problems or to go visit my website uh, to work on the problems there. Uh, that said, uh, if you're using this video to practice these problems, I strongly encourage you to pause the video after I read each question, attempt to work out the question on your own, and then resume playing the video to check your solution. Uh, on the ASVAB, you're not permitted to use a calculator or a reference sheet. So as you take this practice test, uh, try not to make use of any of those resources. Uh, finally, I want to say that in the description of this video, there's going to be timestamps that are associated with each question. Next to the timestamp is going to be the topic that the question's testing, as well as a link to a video in which I discuss that topic in greater detail. So if at any point you feel as if you need more practice, uh, just go ahead and uh, take a look at the description of this video, and there you'll find those additional resources. So all that finally being said, uh, let's go ahead and get started with today's video. All right, so uh, since uh, the arithmetic reasoning subtest starts at question 26 on my website, um, I'm gonna start this video at question number 26. And as we can see, it says, Rick bought three shirts for $18 each, two pairs of socks for $4 a pair, and a pair of slacks for $45. If the sales tax rate is 8.5%, how much do you pay in total? Round your answer to the nearest cent. Okay, so uh, first things first, we have to figure out how much he paid for shirts and socks uh, since we bought three and two pairs of those respectively. So uh, in case you can't do 18 times three in your head, uh, you can work it off to the side like this. It's not that big of a deal. Eight times three is 24. So you're gonna drop down a four and carry a two. Three times one is three plus two is five. So for shirts, he paid $54. And uh, two pairs of socks for $4 a piece, that's two times four, which is just eight. Okay, so let's add these up. We have $54, and I'm gonna include the decimal, uh, plus uh, $8, plus uh, $45 for the one pair of slacks. Okay, and uh, when you're adding decimals, uh, the first thing you can do is just drop down your decimal in place if you want. Again, these are zero plus zero plus zero for both of these, so just bring down our zero. Uh, five plus four is nine plus eight is going to be uh, 17. So we're going to drop down a seven and carry a one. Uh, five plus four is nine plus one is 10. So this is 107. So for the sh three shirts, the two pair of socks and the slacks, he paid 107. Now we have to figure out what 8.5% of 107 is. So we're going to take 107. We're going to multiply that by 8.5%. Uh, of course, we're going to do this in decimal form. So we're not going to multiply this by 8.5. Uh, in decimal form, this is 0 0.085. So we're going to take 107 and multiply it by 0 0.085. And as you can see, we're multiplying a whole number, notably 107, by a decimal, notably 0 0.085. In order to proceed, it's going to be very helpful to get rid of this decimal. And one way you can do that is to take the decimal and shift it one, two, three times to the right to make 0 0.085 just 85. Take note of how many times you move that decimal and then work it out like this, 107 times 85. And once you're done working this out, take those three decimal places that you move to the right here and shift them back into the left. So let's go ahead and do this. Seven times five is 35. So we're gonna carry a three. Uh, zero times five is zero plus three is three. One times five is five. 
since we're starting multiplication with this uh, 8, or before we start multiplication with this 8, we have to bring in a 0 placeholder. Uh, 8 times 7 is going to be 56. Carry a 5. 0 times 8 is 0, plus 5 is 5, and 8 times 1 is 8. Let's add these together. 5 plus 0 is 5. 3 plus 6 is 9. 5 plus 5 is 10. Uh, carry a 1. Uh, 8 plus 1 is 9. Bring our three decimals back in. 1, 2, 3. So our tax amount on this uh, clothing is $9.09. And, uh, and we're going to deal with this 5 in a second because remember, the question said to answer to the nearest cent. Okay, so as far as uh, finding a total price goes, we're going to take our 107 and we're going to add uh, the sales tax amount, which was 9.095, add these together to get our total price. And if you don't have anything here, uh, it's acceptable to place a zero placeholder. And now we can do this addition. Likewise, you could put zeros here if you really needed to see that. But let's go ahead and start adding this. Zero plus five is five. Zero plus nine is nine. Zero plus zero is zero. You can drop down your decimal in place. Seven plus nine is 16. So drop down a six and carry a one. Uh, zero plus zero is zero plus one is one. Uh, one plus zero is one. All right, so uh, this is our total of the clothing including uh, sales tax. But that said, we want to round to the nearest cent. And uh, this is uh, tens, this is uh, one. So we're going to be rounding this nine. And to round, as you may recall, we look to the right. And if that number is five or bigger, we round up. If that number is four or below, we just keep this number the same. Uh, since we have a five to the right of nine, that's going to prompt us to round this up to 116.10. So in total, Rick spent 116.10 on this clothing, and that includes the 8.5% sales tax. So this one is 116.10, which is going to be B. Okay. And on the ASVAB, uh, nothing's going to be too easy. Instead, you should expect a lot of very simple arithmetic that you have to perform over and over again to get these answers. In this case, we had to do simple multiplication here, then we had to add these up, do multiplication with a decimal, and then round. So quite a few steps for this one, but nothing was too difficult. Uh, you should have that feeling on the ASVAB when you take it. All right, number 27 says, if one inch represents 75 miles on a map, then how many inches will represent 690 miles? So uh, this is a problem for which we're going to use a proportion to solve. And uh, in case you haven't seen what a proportion looks like in a while, it's basically two fractions that are equal to each other like this. And what I like to do uh, is take what's given and fill in one side of this proportion and then use the other side to uh, fill in what I'm trying to solve for. So what's given is one inch represents 75 miles. So I'm going to write one inch represents 75 miles on this left-hand side of this equal sign. And as I mentioned in the right-hand side, I'm going to fill in what I'm trying to solve for. And as we can see, we want to know how many inches will 690 miles represent on this map. Um, as you fill in this right-hand side of the proportion, you want to make sure that your units are in the same place. So on, on the left-hand side, I have miles in the denominator. So over here, I'm going to put 690 miles in the denominator as well. Uh, and we want to know how many inches. So that's an unknown value. We're going to represent that with an X. That's going to be X inches. Okay. So now that we have this proportion uh, filled out, we can go ahead and cross multiply. So this becomes 75x equals 1 times 690. Uh, 1 times anything is just itself, so uh, 690 times 1 is just 690. And as you can see, I dropped my units of measurement now because we don't need them. And now we're just solving for x. 
So we're going to divide both sides by 75 to get x by itself. This says x equals 690 over 75. Again, you can regard uh, fractions as long division. So you can read this as 690 divided by 75. And uh, we're going to use our answer choices to help us perform this long division here, since it's not that easy and straightforward to do. Let's think about it. 75 times 10 would be 750. So we know that that is going to be too big as an answer choice. So we're just going to cross this one out. Uh, that said, uh, any of these could be correct. So I'm going to start with the biggest one. I'm asking myself at this point, how many times does 75 go into 6? It doesn't. How many times does 75 go into 69? It doesn't. How many times does 75 go into 690? Well, I'm going to say it's going to be 9 times since I'm using this part of our answer to guide my long division here. So I'm going to do 75 times 9 right here and see if that gives me a value smaller than 690. 9 times 5, of course, is uh, 45. So we're going to drop down a we're going to drop down a 5 and carry a 4. Uh, 7 times 9 is 63, 64, 65, 66, 67. So we can see that 75 times 9 is 675, which is smaller than 690. So we know that our answer is going to be this more than likely. But that said, let's go ahead and work this out for practice. Again, I said 75 times 9 is 675. Let's subtract this. 0 minus 5 we can't do, so we have to bring we have to uh, borrow from here. This becomes an 8. This becomes a 10. 10 minus 5 is 5. 8 minus uh 8 minus 7 is 1. 6 minus 6 is 0. And now we can add a decimal and a free 0, which we can now bring down. And we have to bring that decimal up in place. And the question becomes how many times does 75 go into 150? That's going to be 2 times, and as we should know, 75 times 2 is 150. So we can see there's no remainder here, and 9.2 is, in fact, the correct answer. So on the ASVAB, you're going to have to use proportions at least 2 or 3 times to solve uh, uh, a couple questions. Uh, in the description of this video, I have a link to a video where I talk about proportions and work on, I think, 10 or so practice problems. So if you need more help setting up your proportion to solve these problems, uh, go ahead and check out that video. And right here, we can just fill this in if we want. All right, so that's that one. All right, number 28 says, two trains starting at the same station head in opposite directions. They travel at rates of 25 and 40 miles per hour, respectively. If they start at the same time, how soon will they be 195 miles apart? So um, as you read this problem, uh, you should start thinking about uh, the distance formula. Again, we have a rate of 40 and 25 miles per hour. We have a distance of 195 miles, and we want to know how soon or how long. So we have a time. So in other words, we have all the elements of the distance formula. And again, in case you haven't seen that in a while, it's distance equals rate times time, or d equals rt. Uh, that said, uh, we're going to have to make a modification to this formula in order to solve this problem. Again, let's illustrate what's going on here. We have one train that's going this way at a speed of 25 miles per hour. And we have a train that starts at the same point and heads in the opposite direction, and it's going 40 miles per hour. And the question is, how long will it be before they are 195 miles apart? So normally when we use the distance formula, we only have one rate. And uh, here we can see that we have two rates. Uh, the key to solving a problem when you have uh, trains or cars going in the same or opposite directions is to combine their rates because uh, this question is the same as this. How long will it take one train to go 195 miles 
at a combined rate of 40 and uh, 25 miles per hour. 40 plus 25 is 65 miles per hour. Uh, these problems are identical. Uh, so I'm going to use this, which is the equivalent of this scenario up here, and plug these values into the distance formula to solve this one. So again, we're going to use distance equals rate times time. We know the distance according to the problem was 195 miles. We know the rate uh, for this one. We're going to use the combined rate of both trains. So that's going to be 65. And we know we're trying to solve for T. Um, so to solve for T, we're going to divide both sides by 65. This crosses out here, leaving you just T over here. And as we can see, this is 195 divided by 65. Well, I know 60 times 3 would be 180, and 5 times 3 would be 15. So if we add those together, again, 60 times 3, 180. 5 times 3, 15. 180 plus 15 is 95. So 195 divided by 65 is going to be 3. Uh, in math, it's customary to write the variable for which you solved on the left. So this is going to be t equals 3 hours. Okay, so this one is d, uh, 3 hours. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Number 29 says a math student scored 75, 70, 85, 90, 100 on the first five uh, tests he took. After he took his sixth math test, his class average is now 85. What did he score on the sixth test? So in case uh, it's not obvious, uh, we're working with uh, an average or mean problem here. And an average or mean problem is solved by taking the sum of all the data points you're given, and I just call them numbers, and you're going to divide by how many numbers there are. So... Uh, this problem's a little advanced because we're being asked to solve for one of the data points given the average and five of the data points. So we're going to have to make a modification to this. We know what the average is. His class average is 85. So in place of average over here, I'm going to put 85. We know uh, five of the six data points. They're right here. One, two, three, four, five. So let's write those in. We have 75 plus 70 plus 85 plus 90 plus 100. We don't know what the sixth data point is. That's what we're trying to solve for. So in math, it's customary to uh, represent unknown values with X. So we're going to put plus X to represent that sixth math test. And of course, uh, how many data points are there? There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So now that we have this set up, uh, this problem is pretty easy to do. We're just solving for x at this point. So the first thing I want to do is get rid of this 6 in the denominator. So I'm going to multiply this side by 6 and this side by 6. This will clear out our denominator over here, leaving us with just this. 75 plus 70 plus 85 plus 90 plus 100 plus x equals 85 times 6. I'm going to do that off to the side here. We have 85 times 6. Uh, 5 times 6 is 30, so we're going to bring down a 0 and carry a 3. Uh, 8 times 6 is 48, 49, 50, 51. So this says 510 equals all this plus x. Uh, the next thing I want to do is get x by itself, so I'm going to have to move all these values over to the left. Prior to doing that, though, I'm just going to, and my pen's messing up a little bit here. Let me just redo that. Prior to moving all these values over to the left to get x by itself, I want to find what the sum of them is. So I just have to move one thing. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm going to do that vertically. Okay, we have 100, 90, 85, 70, and 75. Uh, this is 0 plus 0, 5, 0, 5. So this is 10. So we're going to drop down a 0 and carry a 1. Uh, this is, let's see, this is 9 plus 1, which is 10, plus 
8 is going to be 18. 7 and 7 is 14. So this is 18 plus 14. Uh, 8 plus 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Carrier 1, 1, 1, 1 is 3. So this is bring down a 2 and carry a 3. 3 plus 1 is 4. So this is the same as 420 right here. So this is 420 plus x equals 510. Uh, and again, now it should be obvious that to get x by itself, we're going to subtract 420 from both sides. This is going to cross out here, leaving you with just, let me move down a little bit, just leaving you with x. And we have 510 minus uh, 420, which we can work out right here. 0 minus 0 is 0. Uh, 1 minus 2 we can't do, so we're going to have to borrow. This is going to become 4. It's going to become 11. Uh, 11 minus 2 is uh, 9. And 4 minus 4 is 0. So we can see that x equals 90. In math, it's customary to write the variable for which you solved on the left. So this is x equals 90. And this tells us that his sixth, school, his sixth grade on the math test was a 90%. Okay, so that's going to be D. All right, so that's that one. And this is a very common question you'll see on the ASVAB. Generally, you'll see a problem in which you just have to figure out what the average is first. And if you get that right, later on in the test, they'll throw one at you like this, where you'll be given the average and you'll have a missing data point. And you'll have to do this uh, simple algebra here to solve it. So uh, be prepared to solve both types of problems. All right, number 30 says, if a bedroom is 10 feet wide by 12 feet long, then how many square yards is the room? So right off the bat, uh, you should notice that we want to give an answer in terms of yards, but uh, we have uh, measurements given in terms of feet. So at some point, we're going to have to make a conversion. We're either going to have to convert feet to yards right off the bat, or we're going to have to find the area of this bedroom and then convert that area to be in terms of yards. Uh, since there are uh, three feet in every yard and 10 isn't divisible by three, um, I'm going to make this conversion at the very end. So again, we want to find the area of this room. So that's going to be area equals length times width. Uh, we know the width according to the problem is 10 and the length is 12. So this is 12 times 10. Uh, you should be able to do this one in your head. 12 times 10 is 120. So in other words, this bedroom is 120 square feet. That said, we want our answer to be in terms of yards. So we have to think about how we're going to make this conversion. Again, uh, a square yard is just this. Again, we have a square. That's one yard by one yard. And using this information, notably that there's three feet per square yard, we can make this conversion pretty easily. This is the same as a, the same square. That's three feet by three feet. So in one square yard, one times one is one. There are three by three nine square feet, okay? So to convert this 120 square feet to be in terms of yards, we're gonna take 120 square feet and divide it by nine. Now the question is how many times does nine go into 12 without going over, that's one time. One times nine is nine. Uh, 12 minus nine is three, drop down this zero. Um, nine goes into 30, three times without going over nine times three is 27, uh, 30 minus 27 is three. So in other words, the area in terms of yards is going to be 13. And this is our remainder. So we're going to place that right here, three, and we're going to place it over this nine, three over nine yards squared. And we can reduce this fraction right here. Again, both 9 and 3 are divisible by 3. So let's go ahead and reduce this. This is 13. And 3 divided by 3 is 1. 9 divided by 3 is 3 yards squared. Okay, so this one is 13 and 1 third yards squared, which we can see is A. 
pretty challenging problem. Again, you have to know that there are three feet per every yard. In order to convert one yard squared, you take a square that's one by one yard, and you do its equivalent, which would be a square with three by three feet, which would be nine feet squared. Okay, so that's that one. All right, number 31 says a maple desk is being sold at a 36% discount. If the sale price is uh, $496, what was its original price? So for this one, you have to understand what's going on algebraically here. Sales price is always the original price minus the original price times the discount rate. Okay, and uh, let's fill in what we have here. We know what the sales price is. It's four. 96. We don't know what the original price is. And instead of calling that OP, I'm just going to call that X since it's unknown. Minus, again, we don't know what the original price is. So let's call that X. And then the discount rate we were told was 36%. We're going to express that in decimal form as 0.36. So this is going to be times 0.36. Let's go ahead and clean this up a little bit. This says X minus and I'm going to put this 0.36 in front of this x, so 0.36x. Uh, by solving this, we'll know what x, or the original price of this desk, was. Uh, so we can do x minus 0.36x. Again, if it's helpful, you can imagine there's a 1 here. And since a lot of people struggle with this math here, I'm going to work it off to the side. Uh, again, this is the same as 1.00, that's our 1x right here minus 0.36. All right, so let's work that out. Uh, we can't do zero minus six. We're gonna have to come all the way over here and borrow. This is gonna become zero. This is gonna become 10. We have to borrow one more time. So this becomes nine and this becomes 10. 10 minus six is four. Nine minus three is six. Drop down your decimal. Zero minus nothing is nothing. So this is 0.64x equals 496. Okay, so to solve for x now, we're gonna divide both sides by 0.64. This crosses out here, leaving you with just x on this side. And as we can see, uh, it says x equals 496 divided by 0.64. Let's go ahead and express that as long division. This is 496 divided by 0.64. And there are a few ways to go about doing this. Uh, we're trying to figure out 0.64 times what will get you 694. So um, one way you could do this is you can do this long division if you want, and that would require you to shift these decimals. Or you can take this 0.64 and multiply it by all the answer choices until you get 496. And that's what I'm gonna do in this case. I'm being a little bit lazy and I don't wanna do this long division. So I'm gonna do 710 times 0.64. And if that gives me 496, I'll know it's the correct answer. Again, we're multiplying a whole number by a decimal. So let's shift that decimal two times to the right to make this 710 times 64, albeit with two decimals to shift back into the left at the end. 0 times 4 is 0, 4 times 1 is 4, 7 times 4 is 28. Uh, bring in a 0 placeholder before you start multiplication with the 6. 6 times 0 is 0, 1 times 6 is 6, 7 times 6 is 42. 0 plus 0 is 0, 4 plus 0 is 4, 8 plus 6 is 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Uh, carry a 1, uh, 2 plus 2 is 4, plus 1 is 5. And then... Uh, Four plus nothing is four, bringing our two decimals. We can see that this is 454.40. So this one gets you very close to 496. So I'm gonna say this 775 is gonna get us 496 exactly. So let's go ahead and do that. Again, we're gonna do uh, 775 times 0.64. Again, we're multiplying a whole number by a decimal now. So I'm going to shift these two decimals to the right, and this becomes 775 times 64, albeit with two decimals to shift back into the left at the end. Um, 
So let's work this out. Five times four is going to be 20. So drop down a zero, carry a two. Uh, seven times four is 28, 29, 30. So drop down a zero, carry a three. Seven times four is 28, 29, 30, 31. Before you start multiplication with the six, bring in a zero placeholder. Six times five is 30, carry a three. Uh, six times seven is 42, 43, 44, 45, carry a four. Uh, seven times six is 42, 43, 44, 45, 46. Add these up. Zero plus zero is zero. Zero plus zero is zero. Five plus one is six. Six plus three is nine. And four plus nothing is four. Bring in our two decimals. So we can see that uh, 775 times 0.64 is in fact uh, 496. So I know this is going to be 775. 775, which will give me 496 evenly with no remainder. So the answer to this one is, in fact, B, uh, 775. Okay. All right. Number 32 says, if the diameter of a wagon wheel is 2 meters, then how much distance will the wagon have traveled when its wheel completes 100 revolutions? So this is a pretty challenging question. Uh, to start, let's diagram what we have. We have a circular wagon wheel that has a diameter of two meters. Diameter, in case you forgot, is the distance from one edge of a circle to the other edge of the circle and through the center point. So right here is gonna be uh, two meters. And we wanna ask ourselves. How does this circle relate to the distance that's covered by a wagon? Well, imagine if I cut this circle right here and I laid this out like a straight line. Okay. Uh, if we do that, uh, that would give us a distance that this wheel covers every revolution. And as it happens, uh, we can find the length of this circle, around this circle, using the circumference formula. In fact, that's what the circumference formula says. What is the distance around a circle? Uh, so let's go ahead and find the circumference of this circle. Circumference is found by two formulas, either pi times diameter or two pi r. In this case, we know what diameter is. It's two, according to the problem. So the circumference of this circle is gonna be uh, pi times two, and on the ASVAB, uh, you're going to always use an approximation of pi, notably 3.14. So let's go ahead and work this out. We have uh, 3.14 times 2. Uh, as you can see, we're multiplying a decimal, notably 3.14, by a whole number, notably 2. So let's shift this decimal in 3.14 two times to the right to make this 314 times 2. And once we do this arithmetic, we'll take those two decimals that we shifted to the right here and shift them back into the left. So four times two is eight. One times two is two. Three times two is six. Uh, uh, shift our two decimals back in. One, two. So we know the circumference of this uh, circle is 6.28 uh, meters, which means that every revolution... Uh, this circle covers a distance of 6.28 meters in terms of a straight line, okay? So these are equivalent. The circumference, which is the distance around the circle, if we cut it and make it into a straight line like this, that tells us that every revolution covers 6.28 meters. To find out how far it goes uh, when it can, its wheel completes 100 revolutions, we're going to take that 6.28 and multiply it by 100. And uh, this is actually pretty easy. We're doing 6.28 times 100. And uh, as you can see, we're multiplying a decimal by a power of 10. Again, power of 10s are numbers such as 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, and so on. And when you do multiplication or division involving a power of 10, you just take that decimal and you shift it to the right, if you're doing multiplication, according to how many zeros there are in the power of 10, in 100, there are two zeros. So I'm just going to take this decimal and shift it 
uh, two times to the right. And as we can see, uh, 6.28 times 100 is 628. Of course, this is meters. In other words, uh, if this two meter, uh, if this wheel that's two meters in diameter completes 100 revolutions, it will have traveled 628 meters, assuming it goes in a straight line. So uh, this one is 628 meters. All right, number 33 says, it takes 12 hours to fill a water tank. It takes 16 hours to drain the same water tank. Uh, how long will it take to fill the water tank if the drain is left open? So this is what's called a combined rate problem. And uh, on the reference sheet on my website, uh, I have this formula, T over A plus T over B equals one. And this is how you can solve combined rate problems. This is the generic formula for dealing with combined rate problems. T of course refers to time. A refers to the rate of one thing. B refers to the rate of the other, and this one refers to the fact that it takes uh, these two things together this amount of time to complete one task. So let's see what we have here, and we're going to make adjustments to this formula to illustrate what's going on in this word problem. Uh, it takes 12 hours to fill the water tank, so this is going to be our A. 12 hours is going to be our A. It takes 16 hours to drain uh, the same water tank. So this is going to be our B, the 16 hours. And instead of being uh, plus here, we're going to have to do subtraction because this says it takes T over 12 hours to fill the water tank. And at the same time, it takes T over 16 hours to empty the tank. And this subtraction represents the fact that this T over 16 is taking water out. And of course, we want to know how long will it take to fill the one tank if the drain's left open. So we're going to go with this formula right here. Okay. And again, this says, how much time will it take to fill the one tank if it could be filled at a rate of 12 hours and emptied at a rate of 16 hours? So let me go ahead and write this off to the side. We have T over 12 minus T over 16 equals 1. And now this is just a matter of solving for t. And the easiest way to do that is to clear these uh, fractions from the denominator. And that's actually pretty easy to do. If I take this side and multiply it by 48, uh, that will clear both 12 and 16. But I'm going to have to do it to this side as well. So again, uh, t over 12 times 48. Well, 48 divided by 12 is what? Uh, 40, 12, 24, 36, 48. So 48 divided by 12 is going to be 4. We have this T hanging out here. Uh, 48 times T over 16. What's 48 divided by 16? That's 16, 32, 48. So this is going to be 3T here equals 1 times 48, which is just 48. Uh, 4t minus 3t is just t, and we can see that t is 48. In other words, it will take 48 hours to fill this water tank if uh, you're filling it at a rate of 12 hours to fill the tank minus a uh, rate of 16 hours to empty the tank, okay? A lot of people struggle with combined rate problems because one, you have to understand this generic formula, then you have to modify the generic formula to represent what's actually happening in the word problem. And then in addition to those two things, you also have to be confident with fractions in order to simplify quickly and efficiently. Uh, I do have an entire video on combined rates. Uh, so if you need help with combined rates, go ahead and uh, take a look at the link in the description of this video. Again, I would work this out, but this is a practice test. If you need more practice, you need to go watch this video because, uh, again, this is a practice test. I'm showing you how to solve these quickly and efficiently, not necessarily how to do every step. 
All right. Uh, number 34 says each polio vaccination consists of four doses and each measles vaccination consists of two doses. Last year, Dr. Kleinschmidt gave a total of 60 vaccinations that consisted of a total of 184 doses. How many polio vaccinations and how many measles vaccinations did Dr. Kleinschmidt give last year? So whenever you're being asked to solve for two things, that should be a clue that you're going to need a system of equations to do so. Right here it says how many polio vaccinations and how many measles vaccinations did he give. So we want to solve for those two things. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to let X represent polio vaccinations and Y represent measles vaccinations. Okay. And likewise, we know uh, polio vaccinations had four doses. So that's going to be 4X and measles vaccinations consisted of two doses, so that's 2y. All right, so let's look at this sentence right here. This is going to be the key to writing our system of equations. It says, last year, Dr. Kleinschmidt gave a total of 60 vaccinations. Okay, so that's going to be x plus y equals 60. Okay, this says the number of polio vaccinations plus the number of uh, measles vaccinations totaled 60. And right here it says that consisted of 184 doses. Well, we know uh, polio vaccinations require four doses, whereas measles vaccinations require two doses. So we know that the total doses given last year were 184. Okay, and just like that, we now have our system of equations that we can use to solve this one. And as far as system of equations go, uh, there are two methods. Well, there's more than two methods, but generally there are two methods you, you can use to solve these. You can either use the substitution or elimination method. Uh, in this case, it's gonna be, uh, it's, it makes more sense to use the elimination method. And that says, take either one or both the, of the equations, multiply them by a constant such that you eliminate uh, one of the variables when you add those two equations together. So if I take uh, this top equation and multiply it by a constant of negative 2, when I take this negative 2 and multiply it by y, that's going to be negative 2y. And when I add the two equations together, that's going to be negative 2y plus 2y, which will eliminate the y variable. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. Again, we're taking this negative two, we're distributing it to this x, this y, and this 60. So negative two times x is negative two x. Negative two times positive y is negative two y equals negative two times 60, that's negative 120. Uh, we're just copying this equation over. We have four x plus two y equals 184. And again, we're gonna add these two equations together Negative 2x plus 4x is just 2x. Uh, negative 2y plus 2y, that is eliminated. Okay? And now we have 184 minus 120. And I'm going to work that off to the side. 184 minus 120. Uh, 4 minus 0 is 4. 8 minus 2 is 6. Uh, 1 minus 1 is uh, 0. So this says 2x equals 64. To get x by itself, we'll divide both sides by 2. This will cross out. And 64 divided by 2 is pretty easy to do. 6 divided by 2 is 3. 4 divided by 2 is 2. Okay? So we know x is 32. And x refers to, uh, what did we let x be? Uh, x was polio vaccination. So this is going to be, 32 polio vaccinations. Since that's the only answer choice with uh, 32 polio vaccinations, we know D is going to be correct. But that said, let's keep working this one out. Once you get to this point, uh, to solve for Y, you take this value and you plug it into either of the two original equations. And our original equation for this first one said X plus Y equals 60. We now know what x is. x is 32. So this is 32 plus y equals 60. 
Uh, let's solve for y by subtracting 32 from both sides. This crosses out, leaving you with y equals 60 minus 32. 60 minus 32 is going to be uh, 28. So in other words, Dr. Kleinschmidt gave 32 polio vaccinations and 28 measles vaccinations. And we solve that by taking this word problem and writing it as a system of equations, which we can then use to solve uh, the question. Okay. A pretty challenging question. If you're going to do well on the ASVAB, you should expect to see word problems involving a system of equations. All right, number 35 says, during the holiday season, a store offers successive discounts of 10% and 20% on a luxury purse. If the original price of the purse is $600, what is its final sales price? So the wrong way to do this one is to combine 10% and 20%, which would be 30%, and take that off of $600. You cannot combine successive discounts. Uh, you have to apply the discounts one by one. So that's what we're going to do to solve this one. The first discount was 10%. So we're going to take 600 and multiply it by 10% in decimal form. 10% uh, in decimal form is 0 0.10. And as you can see, we're multiplying a whole number, notably 600 by a decimal, notably 0 0.10. So we're going to shift its decimal two times to the right. So this becomes 600 times 10, albeit with two decimals to shift back into the left when we're done. So let's work this out. We have 0 times 0, 0 times 0, uh, 6 times 0. Before we start multiplication with this 1, we have to bring in a 0 placeholder. 1 times 0 is 0. 1 times 0 is 0. 1 times 6 is 6. Uh, 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 0 is 0. 6 plus nothing is 6. Bring our two decimals back in. 1, 2. So 10% of 600 is $60. So to find out what the price is after the first discount uh, was applied is going to be 600 minus 60. Um, 0 minus 0 is 0. 0 minus 6 we can't do, so we're going to have to borrow. This is going to become 5, and this is going to become 10. 10 minus 6 is 4. 5 minus nothing is 5. So after that first 10% discount is applied, uh, we know the sales price is 540. Now we have to figure out what the final sales price is after this second discount is applied. And the second discount was in the amount of 20%. So we're going to take 540 now and multiply it by 0 0.20, which is 20% in decimal form. And uh, that will give us our final sales price. Uh, so let's move this decimal in 0.202 two times to the right to make this 540 times 20, albeit with those two decimals to shift back into the left at the end when we're done. 0 times 0 is 0, 4 times 0 is 0, 5 times 0 is 0. Before we start multiplication with this 2, we have to bring in a 0 placeholder. 2 times 0 is 0. 4 times 2 is 8. 5 times 2 is 10. Let's add these together. Uh, 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 0 is 0. 8 plus 0 is 8. Uh, 0 plus nothing is 0. 1 plus nothing is 1. Bring our two decimals over. So this tells us that 20% of 540 is 108. To find our final sales price, we're going to take 540. And we're going to subtract 108 from it. And we really don't need these decimals, but we can put them in there. Um, so starting right here, we have 0 minus 8, which we can't do. We have to borrow. This becomes 3. This becomes 10. Uh, 10 minus 8 is 2. 3 minus nothing is 3. And 5 minus 1 is 4. So our final sales price, as we can see, is 432, which is answer choice A. Okay. So that is it for this practice test. In all honesty, uh, many of these problems were pretty challenging. Uh, that said, if you expect to score somewhere between 75 and 99 on the ASVAB, uh, you should expect 
this level of difficulty on the problems that you're going to see. Uh, regardless, I hope you found this video helpful. Again, I like to show you the techniques you can use to solve problems. I don't like to show you exactly every variation of every problem you're going to see. As long as you know these techniques, like uh, uh, using a proportion to solve a problem, uh, you should be good to go on test day. Uh, if you like the content I'm creating, uh, please consider subscribing to my channel. Likewise, you're more than welcome to leave feedback in the comment section below. Uh, but on that note, I'm going to go ahead and cut you loose. Konnichiwa.